Chapter twenty two of the Voyage Out by Virginia Wool. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The darkness fell but rose again, and as each day spread widely over the earth and parted them from the strange day in the forest when they had been forced to tell each other what they wanted, this wish of theirs was revealed to other people and in the process became slightly strange to themselves. Apparently it was not anything unusual that had happened. It was that they had become engaged to marry each other. The world, which consisted for the most part of the hotel and the villa, expressed itself glad on the whole that two people should marry, and allowed them to see that they were not expected to take part in the work which has to be done, in order that the world shall go on, but might absent themselves for a time. They were accordingly left alone, until they felt the silence, as if, playing in a vast church, the door had been shut on them. They were driven to walk alone, and sit alone, to visit secret places where the flowers had never been picked and the trees were solitary. In solitude they could express those beautiful but too vast desires which were so oddly uncomfortable to the ears of other men and women, desires for a world such as their own world which contained two people seemed to them to be, where people knew each other intimately and thus judged each other by what was good and never quarrelled, because that was waste of time. They would talk of such questions among books, or out in the sun, or sitting in the shade of a tree undisturbed. They were no longer embarrassed, or half choked with meaning which could not express itself. They were not afraid of each other, or, like travellers down a twisting river, dazzled with sudden beauties when the corner is turned. The unexpected happened, but even the ordinary was lovable, and in many ways preferable to the ecstatic and mysterious, for it was refreshingly solid, and called out effort, and effort under such circumstances was not effort but delight. When Rachel played the piano, Terence sat near her, engaged, as far as the occasional writing of a word in pencil testified, in shaping the world as it appeared to him now that he and Rachel were going to be married. It was different, certainly. The book called Silence would not now be the same book that it would have been. He would then put down his pencil and stare in front of him and wonder in what respects the world was different. It had, perhaps, more solidity, more coherence, more importance, greater depth. Why, even the earth sometimes seemed to him very deep, not carved into hills and cities and fields, but heaped in great masses. He would look out of the window for ten minutes at a time, but no, he did not care for the earth swept of human beings. He liked human beings. He liked them, he suspected, better than Rachel did. There she was, swaying enthusiastically over her music, quite forgetful of him. But he liked that quality in her. He liked the impersonality which it produced in her. At last, having written down a series of little sentences with notes of interrogation attached to them, he observed aloud, Women. Under the heading, Women, I've written. Not really vainer than men. Lack of self-confidence at the base of most serious faults. Dislike of own sex traditional or founded on fact every woman not so much a rake at heart as an optimist, because they don't think. What do you say, Rachel? 
he paused with his pencil in his hand and a sheet of paper on his knee. Rachel said nothing. Up and up the steep spiral of a very late Beethoven sonata she climbed, like a person ascending a ruined staircase, energetically at first, then more laboriously advancing her feet with effort until she could go no higher and returned with a run to begin at the very bottom again. Again, it's the fashion now to say that women are more practical and less idealistic than men, also that they have considerable organizing ability, but no sense of honor. Query. What is meant by masculine term honor? What corresponds to it in your sex, eh? Attacking her staircase once more, Rachel again neglected this opportunity of revealing the secrets of her sex. She had, indeed, advanced so far in the pursuit of wisdom that she allowed these secrets to rest undisturbed. It seemed to be reserved for a later generation to discuss them philosophically. Crashing down a final chord with her left hand, she exclaimed at last, swinging round upon him. No, Terence, it's no good. Here I am, the best musician in South America, not to speak of Europe and Asia, and I can't play a note because of you in the room, interrupting me every other second. You don't seem to realize that that's what I've been aiming at for the last half hour, he remarked. I've no objection to nice simple tunes. Indeed, I find them very helpful to my literary composition. But that kind of thing is merely like an unfortunate old dog going round on its hind legs in the rain. He began turning over the little sheets of notepaper which were scattered on the table, conveying the congratulations of their friends. All possible wishes for all possible happiness, he read. Correct, but not very vivid, are they? They're sheer nonsense, Rachel exclaimed. Think of words compared with sounds, she continued. Think of novels and plays and histories. Perched on the edge of the table, she stirred the red and yellow volumes contemptuously. She seemed to herself to be in a position where she could despise all human learning. Terence looked at them, too. "'God, Rachel, you do read trash!' he exclaimed. "'And you're behind the times, too, my dear. No one dreams of reading this kind of thing now. Antiquated problem plays, harrowing descriptions of life in the East End. Oh, no! We've exploded all that. Read poetry, Rachel. Poetry, poetry, poetry. Picking up one of the books, he began to read aloud, his intention being to satirize the short, sharp bark of the writer's English. But she paid no attention, and after an interval of meditation, exclaimed, does it ever seem to you, Terence, that the world is composed entirely of vast blocks of matter, and that we're nothing but patches of light? She looked at the soft spots of sun wavering over the carpet and up the wall. Like that. No, said Terence. I feel solid, immensely solid. The legs of my chair might be rooted in the bowels of the earth. But at Cambridge, I can remember, there were times when one fell into ridiculous states of semi-coma about five o'clock in the morning. Hurst does now, I expect. Oh, no, Hurst wouldn't. Rachel continued. The day your note came, asking us to go on the picnic, I was sitting where you're sitting now, thinking that. I wonder if I could think that again. I wonder if the world's changed, and if so, when it'll stop changing, and which is the real world. 
When I first saw you, he began, I thought you were like a creature who'd lived all its life among pearls and old bones. Your hands were wet, do you remember? And you never said a word until I gave you a bit of bread. And then you said, human beings. And I thought you, a prig, she recollected. No, that's not quite it. There were the ants who stole the tongue, and I thought you and St. John were like those ants, very big, very ugly, very energetic, with all your virtues on your backs. However, when I talked to you, I liked you. You fell in love with me, he corrected her. You were in love with me all the time, only you didn't know it. No, I never fell in love with you, she asserted. Rachel, what a lie! Didn't you sit here looking at my window? Didn't you wander about the hotel like an owl in the sun? No, she repeated, I never fell in love. If falling in love is what people say it is. And it's the world that tells the lies, and I tell the truth. Oh, what lies, what lies! She crumpled together a handful of letters from Evelyn M., from Mr. Pepper, from Mrs. Thornbury and Miss Allen, and Susan Warrington. It was strange, considering how very different these people were, that they used almost the same sentences when they wrote to congratulate her upon her engagement. That any one of these people had ever felt what she felt, or could ever feel it, or had even the right to pretend for a single second that they were capable of feeling it, appalled her much as the church service had done, much as the face of the hospital nurse had done. And if they didn't feel a thing, why did they go and pretend to? The simplicity and arrogance and hardness of her youth, now concentrated into a single spark as it was by her love of him, puzzled Terence. Being engaged had not that effect on him. The world was different, but not in that way. He still wanted the things he had always wanted, and in particular he wanted the companionship of other people more than ever, perhaps. He took the letters out of her hand and protested. Of course they're absurd, Rachel. Of course they say things just because other people say them. But even so, what a nice woman Miss Allen is. You can't deny that. And Mrs. Thornbury, too. She's got too many children, I grant you. But if half a dozen of them had gone to the bad, instead of rising infallibly to the tops of their trees, hasn't she a kind of beauty, of elemental simplicity, as Flushing would say? Isn't she rather like a large old tree murmuring in the moonlight, or a river going on and on and on? By the way, Rafe's been made governor of the Carroway Islands, the youngest governor in the service. Very good, isn't it? But Rachel was at present unable to conceive that the vast majority of the affairs of the world went on unconnected by a single thread with her own destiny. I won't have eleven children, she asserted. I won't have the eyes of an old woman. She looks at one up and down, up and down, as if one were a horse. We must have a son and we must have a daughter, said Terence, putting down the letters, because let alone the inestimable advantage of being our children, they'd be so well brought up. They went on to sketch an outline of the ideal education, how their daughter should be required from infancy to gaze at a large square of cardboard painted blue to suggest thoughts of infinity, for women were grown too practical. And their son, he should be taught to laugh at great men, 
that is, at distinguished successful men, at men who wore ribbons and rose to the tops of their trees. He should in no way resemble, Rachel added, St. John Hurst. At this Terence professed the greatest admiration for St. John Hurst. Dwelling upon his good qualities, he became seriously convinced of them. He had a mind like a torpedo, he declared, aimed at falsehood. Where should we all be without him and his like? Choked in weeds. Christians, bigots. Why, Rachel herself would be a slave with a fan to sing songs to men when they felt drowsy. But you'll never see it, he exclaimed. Because with all your virtues you don't and you never will, care with every fibre of your being for the pursuit of truth. You've no respect for facts, Rachel. You're essentially feminine. She did not trouble to deny it, nor did she think good to produce the one unanswerable argument against the merits which Terence admired. St. John Hurst said that she was in love with him, she would never forgive that. But the argument was not one to appeal to a man. But I like him, she said, and she thought to herself that she also pitied him, as one pities those unfortunate people who are outside the warm mysterious globe full of charges and miracles in which we ourselves move about. She thought that it must be very dull to be St. John Hurst. She summed up what she felt about him by saying that she would not kiss him, supposing he wished it, which was not likely. As if some apology were due to Hurst for the kiss which she then bestowed upon him, Terence protested, and compared with Hurst, I'm a perfect zany. The clock here struck twelve instead of eleven. We're wasting the morning. I ought to be writing my book, and you ought to be answering these. We've only got twenty-one whole mornings left, said Rachel, and my father'll be here in a day or two. However, she drew a pen and paper towards her and began to write laboriously. My dear Evelyn. Terence, meanwhile, read a novel which someone else had written, a process which he found essential to the composition of his own. For a considerable time nothing was to be heard but the ticking of the clock and the fitful scratch of Rachel's pen as she produced phrases which bore a considerable likeness to those which she had condemned. She was struck by it herself, for she stopped writing and looked up, looked at Terence deep in the armchair, looked at the different pieces of furniture, at her bed in the corner, at the window pane which showed the branches of a tree filled in with sky heard the clock ticking, and was amazed at the gulf which lay between all that and her sheet of paper. Would there ever be a time when the world was one and indivisible? Even with Terence himself, how far apart they could be, how little she knew what was passing in his brain now. She then finished her sentence, which was awkward and ugly and stated that they were both very happy, and going to be married in the autumn, probably, and hope to live in London, where we hope you will come and see us when we get back. Choosing affectionately, after some further speculation, rather than sincerely, she signed the letter and was doggedly beginning on another, when Terence remarked, quoting from his book, Listen to this, Rachel. It is probable that Hugh, he's the hero, a literary man, had not realized at the time of his marriage any more than the young man of parts and imagination 
usually does realise, the nature of the gulf which separates the needs and desires of the male from the needs and desires of the female. At first they had been very happy. The walking tour in Switzerland had been a time of jolly companionship and stimulating revelations for both of them. Betty had proved herself the ideal comrade. They had shouted, Love in the Valley, to each other across the snowy slopes of the Riffelhorn, and so on and so on. I'll skip the descriptions. But in London, after the boy's birth, all was changed. Betty was an admirable mother, but it did not take her long to find out that motherhood, as that function is understood by the mother of the upper middle classes, did not absorb the whole of her energies. She was young and strong, with healthy limbs and a body and brain that called urgently for exercise. In short, she began to give tea parties. Coming in late from this singular talk with old Bob Murphy in his smoky book-lined room, where the two men had each unloosened his soul to the other, with the sound of the traffic humming in his ears and the foggy London sky slung tragically across his mind, he found women's hats dotted about among his papers, women's wraps and absurd little feminine shoes and umbrellas were in the hall. Then the bills began to come in. He tried to speak frankly to her. He found her lying on the great polar bear skin in their bedroom, half undressed, for they were dining with the greens in Wilton Crescent, the ruddy firelight making the diamonds wink and twinkle on her bare arms, and in the delicious curve of her breast, a vision of adorable femininity. He forgave her all. Well, this goes from bad to worse, and finally, about fifty pages later, Hugh takes a weekend ticket to Swanage and has it out with himself on the downs above Corf. Here there's fifteen pages or so which we'll skip. The conclusion is, they were different. Perhaps in the far future, when generations of men had struggled and failed as he must now struggle and fail. Woman would be, indeed what she now made a pretense of being, the friend and companion, not the enemy and parasite of man. The end of it is, you see, Hugh went back to his wife, poor fellow. It was his duty as a married man, Lord, Rachel, he concluded, will it be like that when we're married? Instead of answering him, she asked, why don't people write about the things they do feel? Ah, that's the difficulty, he sighed, tossing the book away. Well, then, what will it be like when we're married? What are the things people do feel? She seemed doubtful. Sit on the floor and let me look at you, he commanded. Resting her chin on his knee, she looked straight at him. He examined her curiously. You're not beautiful, he began, but I like your face. I like the way your hair grows down in a point, and your eyes, too. They never see anything. Your mouth's too big, and your cheeks would be better if they had more colour in them. But what I like about your face is that it makes one wonder what the devil you're thinking about. It makes me want to do that. He clenched his fist and shook it so near her that she started back. Because now you look as if you'd blow my brains out. There are moments, he continued, when, if we stood on a rock together, you'd throw me into the sea. Hypnotized by the force of his eyes in hers, she repeated, if we stood on a rock together. To be flung into the sea, 
to be washed hither and thither, and driven about the roots of the world. The idea was incoherently delightful. She sprang up and began moving about the room, bending and thrusting aside the chairs and tables as if she were indeed striking through the waters. He watched her with pleasure. She seemed to be cleaving a passage for herself, and dealing triumphantly with the obstacles which would hinder their passage through life. It does seem possible, he exclaimed, though I've always thought it the most unlikely thing in the world. I shall be in love with you all my life, and our marriage will be the most exciting thing that's ever been done. We'll never have a moment's peace. He caught her in his arms as she passed him, and they fought for mastery, imagining a rock and the sea heaving beneath them. At last she was thrown to the floor, where she lay gasping and crying for mercy. I'm a mermaid. I can swim, she cried. So the game's up. Her dress was torn across, and peace being established, she fetched a needle and thread and began to mend the tear. And now, she said, be quiet and tell me about the world. Tell me about everything that's ever happened, and I'll tell you. Let me see, what can I tell you? I'll tell you about Miss Montgomery and the river party. She was left, you see, with one foot in the boat and the other on shore. They had spent much time already in thus filling out for the other the course of their past lives and the characters of their friends and relations, so that very soon Terence knew not only what Rachel's aunts might be expected to say upon every occasion, but also how their bedrooms were furnished, and what kind of bonnets they wore. He could sustain a conversation between Mrs. Hunt and Rachel, and carry on a tea party, including the Reverend William Johnson and Miss McQuoid, the Christian scientists, with remarkable likeness to the truth. But he had known many more people, and was far more highly skilled in the art of narrative than Rachel was, whose experiences were, for the most part, of a curiously childlike and humorous kind, so that it generally fell to her lot to listen and ask questions. He told her not only what had happened, but what he had thought and felt, and sketched for her portraits which fascinated her, of what other men and women might be supposed to be thinking and feeling, so that she became very anxious to go back to England, which was full of people, where she could merely stand in the streets and look at them. According to him, too, there was an order, a pattern, which made life reasonable, or if that word was foolish, made it of deep interest anyhow, for sometimes it seemed possible to understand why things happened as they did. Nor were people so solitary and uncommunicative as she believed. She should look for vanity, for vanity was a common quality, first in herself, and then in Helen, in Ridley, in St. John. They all had their share of it, and she would find it in ten people out of every twelve she met, and once linked together by one such tie, she would find them not separate and formidable, but practically indistinguishable, and she would come to love them when she found that they were like herself. If she denied this, she must defend her belief that human beings were as various as the beasts at the zoo, which had stripes and manes and horns and humps. And so, wrestling over the entire list of their acquaintances, and diverging into anecdote and theory and speculation, 
they came to know each other. The hours passed quickly, and seemed to them full to leaking point. After a night's solitude, they were always ready to begin again. The virtues which Mrs. Ambrose had once believed to exist in free talk between men and women did in truth exist for both of them, although not quite in the measure she prescribed. Far more than upon the nature of sex they dwelt upon the nature of poetry. But it was true that talk which had no boundaries deepened and enlarged the strangely small bright view of a girl. In return for what he could tell her, she brought him such curiosity and sensitiveness of perception that he was led to doubt whether any gift bestowed by much reading and living was quite the equal of that for pleasure and pain. What would experience give her after all except a kind of ridiculous formal balance, like that of a drilled dog in the street? He looked at her face and wondered how it would look in twenty years' time, when the eyes had dulled, and the forehead wore those little persistent wrinkles which seem to show that the middle-aged are facing something hard which the young do not see. What would the hard thing be for them, he wondered. Then his thoughts turned to their life in England. The thought of England was delightful, for together they would see the old things freshly. It would be England in June, and there would be June nights in the country, and the nightingales singing in the lanes, into which they could steal when the room grew hot, and there would be English meadows gleaming with water and set with stolid cows and clouds dipping low and trailing across the green hills. As he sat in the room with her, he wished very often to be back again in the thick of life, doing things with Rachel. He crossed to the window and exclaimed, Lord, how good it is to think of lanes, muddy lanes, with brambles and nettles, you know, and real grass fields, and farmyards with pigs and cows and men walking beside carts with pitchforks. There's nothing to compare with that here. Look at the stony red earth and the bright blue sea, and the glaring white houses. How tired one gets of it! And the air, without a stain or a wrinkle. I'd give anything for a sea mist. Rachel, too, had been thinking of the English country, the flat land rolling away to the sea, and the woods and the long straight roads where one can walk for miles without seeing anyone, and the great church towers and the curious houses clustered in the valleys, and the birds and the dusk, and the rain falling against the windows. But London, London's the place, Terence continued. They looked together at the carpet, as though London itself were to be seen there, lying on the floor, with all its spires and pinnacles pricking through the smoke. On the whole, what I should like best at this moment, Terence pondered, would be to find myself walking down King's Way, by those big placards, you know and turning into the Strand. Perhaps I might go and look over Waterloo Bridge for a moment. Then I'd go along the Strand past the shops, with all the new books in them, and through the little archway into the temple. I always like the quiet after the uproar. You hear your own footsteps suddenly quite loud. The temple's very pleasant. I think I should go and see if I could find dear old Hodgkin, the man who writes books about Van Eyck, you know. When I left England he was very sad about his tame magpie. 
he suspected that a man had poisoned it. And then, Russell lives on the next staircase. I think you'd like him. He's a passion for Handel. Well, Rachel, he concluded, dismissing the vision of London. We shall be doing that together in six weeks' time. And it'll be the middle of June, then. And June in London. My God, how pleasant it all is. And we're certain to have it, too, she said. It isn't as if we were expecting a great deal, only to walk about and look at things. Only a thousand a year and perfect freedom, he replied. How many people in London do you think have that? And now you've spoilt it, she complained. Now we've got to think of the horrors. She looked grudgingly at the novel, which had once caused her perhaps an hour's discomfort, so that she had never opened it again, but kept it on her table, and looked at it occasionally, as some medieval monk kept a skull or a crucifix to remind him of the frailty of the body. Is it true, Terence, she demanded, that women die with bugs crawling across their faces? I think it's very probable, he said. But you must admit, Rachel, that we so seldom think of anything but ourselves, that an occasional twinge is really rather pleasant. Accusing him of an affectation of cynicism, which was just as bad as sentimentality itself, she left her position by his side and knelt upon the window sill twisting the curtain tassels between her fingers. A vague sense of dissatisfaction filled her. "'What's so detestable in this country,' she exclaimed, "'is the blue. Always blue sky and blue sea. It's like a curtain. All the things one wants are on the other side of that. I want to know what's going on behind it. I hate these divisions. Don't you, Terence? One person all in the dark about another person. Now I liked the Dalloways, she continued, and they're gone. I shall never see them again. Just by going on a ship we cut ourselves off entirely from the rest of the world. I want to see England there, London there all sorts of people. Why shouldn't one? Why should one be shut up all by oneself in a room? While she spoke thus half to herself, and with increasing vagueness, because her eye was caught by a ship that had just come into the bay, she did not see that Terence had ceased to stare contentedly in front of him, and was looking at her keenly and with dissatisfaction. She seemed to be able to cut herself adrift from him, and to pass away to unknown places where she had no need of him. The thought roused his jealousy. I sometimes think you're not in love with me, and never will be, he said energetically. She started and turned round at his words. I don't satisfy you in the way you satisfy me, he continued. There's something I can't get hold of in you. You don't want me as I want you. You're always wanting something else. He began pacing up and down the room. Perhaps I ask too much, he went on. Perhaps it isn't really possible to have what I want. Men and women are too different. You can't understand. You don't understand. He came up to where she stood looking at him in silence. It seemed to her now that what he was saying was perfectly true, and that she wanted many more things than the love of one human being. The sea, the sky, she turned again and looked at the distant blue, 
which was so smooth and serene where the sky met the sea she could not possibly want only one human being or is it only this damnable engagement he continued let's be married here before we go back or is it too great a risk are we sure we want to marry each other they began pacing up and down the room but although they came very near each other in their pacing they took care not to touch each other the hopelessness of their position overcame them both they were impotent they could never love each other sufficiently to overcome all these barriers and they could never be satisfied with less realizing this with intolerable keenness she stopped in front of him and exclaimed let's break it off then the words did more to unite them than any amount of argument as if they stood on the edge of a precipice they clung together they knew that they could not separate painful and terrible it might be but they were joined forever they lapsed into silence and after a time crept together in silence merely to be so close soothed them and sitting side by side the divisions disappeared and it seemed as if the world were once more solid and entire and as if in some strange way they had grown larger and stronger it was long before they moved and when they moved it was with great reluctance they stood together in front of the looking-glass and with a brush tried to make themselves look as if they had been feeling nothing all morning neither pain nor happiness but it chilled them to see themselves in the glass for instead of being vast and indivisible they were really very small and separate the size of the glass leaving a large space for the reflection of other things End of chapter 22